Welcome to the University of Kent's Brussels School of International Studies and our series of webinars, Interdisciplinary Interventions. My name is Jeremy Corrett. I'm Dean for Europe and Professor of Philosophy, Religion and Culture at the University of Kent. This is our final webinar in this series of interdisciplinary reflections, which have been exploring the challenges of COVID-19 and its effects both on Europe, the political world and the humanities. We've looked at issues of identity, community, nationalism and globalism. And today we're returning to the question of Brexit three weeks ahead of the deadline for any extension of negotiations. Our challenge here is to understand the nature of the European situation and take a look at Norway as a comparison for these challenges. Can we compare Brexit with Norway's no vote in 1972 and 1994? Are there any reasons for Norway's no vote that can be linked with Brexit? And is the Norway model still relevant? And what are the wider political challenges that we should consider in this Brexit period? It's great to have so many of you here. I can see many of you joining and the numbers are coming up over the screen. You will see that my eyes will be flashing from left to right because I will be picking up questions from you in the webinar and also from the panelists. It's great to have you here. I can see that people from various time zones and all around the world, thank you for joining us. This is a webinar, so please do send your questions in. I have a Q&A a panel by my side here. I will be picking those questions up and offering those to the panelists. To explore this challenge of Brexit, we have given today's title In, Out and Shake It All About, Brexit and the Norway Comparison. And we're trying to kind of understand this new context and whether Norway is still relevant. So to explore these questions today, I have a group of specialists in the area of EU relations and politics. And I'm pleased to welcome the first panelist, Professor Richard Whitman. He is the director of the Global Europe Centre and Professor of Politics and International Relations at the University of Kent. He is uh, Associate Fellow and former head of the Europe Programme at the Royal Institute of, uh, of Affairs at Chatham House, the author of numerous articles and books on EU and Brexit relations, including an article recently, the, EU, the UK's European Diplomatic Strategy for Brexit and Beyond in the International Affairs Journal, and his current research is on future foreign and security and defence policies between the UK and the EU. Welcome, Richard. Are you with us? Thank you, Jeremy. Great to have you with us. The next panellist is Professor John Eric Fossum. He is a professor at ARENA, which is the Centre of European Studies at the University of Oslo in Norway. He has worked and published widely on issues of identity, democracy and constitutionalism and EU and Canada. He's led various research projects on the EU, including being the coordinator of the H2020 project EU3D, Differentiation, Domination and Democracy. His most recent books include Squaring the Circle of, on Brexit, Could the Norway Model Work, with Hans Peter Grave, amongst other papers. He's also written Can Brexit Improve Our Understanding of Wicked Problems, and is the author of the Oxford Research Encyclopedia entry, Norway and European Union. Welcome, John Eric. Can you hear us? Yes, thank you very much. Good to have you here. Our next panelist is Professor Amelia Hadfield, head of the Department of Politics at the University of Surrey in the United Kingdom, director of the Centre of Britain and Europe. She's a specialist on common security and defence policy, EU politics and, and EU foreign affairs and EU-UK relations. She has written numerous articles on EU policy and Brexit, including a recent joint paper with Simon Lightfoot entitled The Future of EU Development Policy Post-2020, and also joint editor with Richard Whitman and Ian Manners, a book called Foreign Policy and EU Members, Continuity and Europeanisation. Welcome, Amelia. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thanks, Jeremy. Great to be here. Great to have you here. And our final panelist today is Albina Azamanova. She's reader in political and social thought at the University of Kent's Brussels School of International Studies. She is a political theorist and specialist in democratic thinking and political economy. Amongst her numerous books and articles, she has recently published an article entitled Anti-Capital in the 21st Century, 
on the metacrisis of capitalism and the prospects for radical politics in philosophy and social criticism. And her most recent work, just appearing before the COVID crisis, is entitled Capitalism on the Edge, How Fighting Precarity Can Achieve Radical Change Without Crisis or Utopia. Albena, are you with us? Uh, happy to join. Yeah, thank you very much. Do leave your, your microphones on so that you can come in at any point. Um, it's great that you can all join us um, for, for this debate. And we have a very peculiar metaphor. I, I know that John Eric, in his own book on squaring Europe, has included the metaphor of the elephant in the boat, and perhaps he can illuminate us on that metaphor later to describing EU-Norway uh, relationships. Um, but Richard, can I just start with you and, and ask you to explain our title for today, In, Out and Shake It All About, and what this tells us about current EU-UK negotiations. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy, and thank you to all of you who are listening at this time. Um, uh, our title really derives from a dance that will be familiar to our UK listeners, uh, which is the, the Hokey Cokey, sometimes called the Hokey Pokey, I think in Canada for Amelia, and also the Boogie Woogie, uh, I think in France. And it, it involves everybody standing in a circle and putting parts of your body in and out uh, and your whole self at one time, uh, and also shaking yourself all about. Uh, and I think it's a pretty good metaphor for uh, Britain's relationship to, to Europe, European integration and the current Brexit negotiations. Uh, and I think it's worth casting our mind back a bit to, to just uh, appreciate where the UK was and, and where the UK is now. We go back to the, the 1950s. British governments wanted to be out of the circle of European uh, integration. So we were um, uh, standing outside that process. Then governments decided in the 1960s they wanted to be in, but President wanted to be out. And then Edward Heath's government saw the UK joining the circle in 1973, but Harold Wilson's successor government was divided between who wanted to be in uh, and those who wanted to be out. So the public got an in-out referendum and decided to be in. Then Margaret Thatcher's government was uh, all for in, but sometimes sounded as if it wanted to be out. And John Major's government wanted in, but he also wanted uh, opt-outs. Tony Blair definitely wanted to be in, uh, and he wanted to be in in uh, by joining the single currency, but his Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown, wanted to be out. And David Cameron, of course, was all for being in, but he wanted to assuage the British <laughs> party who wanted out, uh, and so he promised the public a decision on whether we'd be in or out. So he negotiated for in, campaigned for in, but got out. Uh, and Theresa May famously said, out means out. I think you might have froze, I'm just picking up. Um, he also wants to shake it all out. So the circle. So agreed we on uh, withdrawal and making the to get their uh, future relationship sorted out and outlined in the political declaration. He seems to be very much in favour of being outside the circle and favouring a different dance, some might say headbanging uh, rather than uh, uh, dancing the, dancing the, the, uh, the okie koki. Um, and, and we're in this peculiar position at the moment uh, until the end of the year where the UK is in transition with the EU, so it's in EU policies and the EU budget as out of the relevant policy making institutions. And you know, where I've been surprised is it's done a lot less shake it all about than I expected. In other words, perhaps causing, uh, causing difficulties for the EU uh, in transition in general, but I think that's partly explained by COVID, which we may get back to uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit later. Now those different, those different phases of the dance, I think, are different from Norway, uh, and uh, John Eric will, will talk about that. But I just want to really put three things on the table uh, as, as far as uh, where we are uh, with, the, with the kind of context, and I'll, I'll do these very briefly. The first uh, is, is to say that, you know, the, the UK is almost certainly going to be in a position in which Europe's going to dominate its, its politics, its domestic politics. Um, and, and for just two reasons, perhaps to flag up now, is the, the politics of the, the Union of the United Kingdom, 
but I think almost certainly uh, the, uh, the, the party politics, because again, to read across to Norway, uh, it's been an issue within Norwegian party politics. So again, I'd be interested to hear from John Eric on that. Secondly, I think this connects with, with some point that Amelia may make is that in leaving the EU, the UK changes the international relations of Europe. Um, but uh, I don't think we've fully rehearsed what the consequences of those are yet. Uh, and that's something still to arrive, partly because of the transition. And then lastly, uh, I think that the societal aspects of Europe, which really don't get as much airtime as they deserve, uh, let's call it the informal integration, the way in which the UK has been a, and become a very European country uh, in societal, political and economic terms uh, through the period uh, of its membership. I think those are really going to be in tension with the, the formal integrative relationship with the EU. I think you're going to have a great gap between what the public expectation is about their relationship with Europe, meaning the EU, because the I think you're, you're, you're tuning in the formal in relation is going to throw up all sorts of uh, all sorts of issues. Uh, I would suggest so. I'll leave it there and uh, on some of those our uh, colleagues have spoken. Thank. thank you. Thank, thank you, Richard. I, I, I get the, the sense now of, of the metaphor of this difficulty of moving in, in, in and out. I just wonder whether you might be able to give us the present state of the dance. As, 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 like our screens, has the dance frozen? And uh, w w just give us a, a brief sentence on where we are today. Um, if you didn't hear me, I said that I thought that Boris Johnson was headbanging rather than dancing the okie pokey. Um, right. but but I think uh, more accurately, with the two sides are dancing past each other. I mean, I think that the, the UK has moved very quickly away from the commitments that it wrote into the political declaration with the EU uh, and, is, and is dancing. It's difficult to work out whether that's, you know, whether that's a strategy or a tactic rather. Uh, yeah, we, government we, is thinking about uh, uh, with you. Thank you, Richard. I think we've had a few a few technical um, uh, hitches in, in getting all of that, but I think we've got the general um, uh, message. I think we're going to, I'm going to move uh, to John Eric now. Uh, I mean, we've we've got the sense of this precarious in and out movement of, of of British politics in relationship to the EU, and and I guess a key kind of question uh, going forward. We, as we've discussed often the Norway model in terms of that relationship, but can Norway still help us in exploring this issue today? And is, is Norway still relevant for, for thinking about our reflections on UK EU relations? Thank you for being here, yes. And the answer is yes, um, but with certain provisos. Um, now I have, I'll, I'll list three points I think that, that should help us to, to focus this, um, that don't necessarily refer so much to the uh, referenda and so on, although um, that are, there are parallels there too. But, but the first point is that the EU itself prefers something EA-like as its main affiliation with non-members. That is those members that, that qualify for membership because they differentiate between those that basically qualify in democratic, political, administrative and market adaptation terms. And Norway, of course, and, and the EEA and Switzerland are countries that do. So they are countries that would, would have uh, qualified and become members if they had wanted to. Um, now, so the EU, and I suspect what you can see also in even in the Barnier draft is that there is a certain type of openness there um, that the, the Barnier would like to try to nudge the UK in that direction, even if it looks like, according to an analysis by Nanette Neuwald that we would be publishing as a working paper with our project, is that the general Barnier's draft looks like it is more similar to the CETA agreement, the, the EU-Canada agreement. But there seems to be wiggle room in this one that would mean that um, the um, EU could push the uh, UK towards the Norway model, but not with the type of institutions that are currently in place regulating Norway's relationship with the EA countries. So the first thing is that the EU actually wants that type of arrangement. The second one is the context of sovereignty that Richard also was touching on in Europe. That is that it has changed. I, I take seriously what K.O. Hain talked about in terms of pooling and sharing of sovereignty. 
And that means that it is for, for protecting sovereignty in today's Europe, you have to have access to the main decision-making bodies in the EU because the EU sets the terms of shared rule across Europe. Now, what Norway also has experienced in this is that, of course, has experienced the, the lack of access to this, but that's only one side of it. The fact is that this EU influence doesn't only reach to the areas that, have, that they have decided to do in common, but the dynamics of the development of the single market and the EU's development in other policy areas means that this is also eating into areas of self-rule. And therefore the whole idea of, of sovereignty in this sense must be, re, must be rethought because you cannot think about sovereignty without also taking the EU dimension into account at the same time. So this is a conundrum that Norway is facing and it has to do with geography, but it also has to do with economic and other types of interrelationships, and these are them. Now, this is interesting then also in relation to the COVID-19 question or the pandemic, because insofar as the EU is weakening from internal and other types of tensions, the EU's ability to exert pressure uh, and, and, and establish and maintain this type of system, of course, will be weakened. Um, and that, of course, will give the UK more uh, uh, leverage. But if the EU consolidates, the UK will be in a sim similar situation to Norway's because the, the weight will be different and it will be regulated by rules. So the question, of course, is to what extent EU rules will continue binding or whether this will be more subject to power politics and political bargaining. And I would wager that the extent to which you get the latter, then the, EU's, the UK's weight will, will increase. But if it is still a question of rule bound, then access to EU decision-making bodies is the key element. So that will be the second aspect. And that Norway's experience in that sense is relevant. Um, but of course, it depends on what type of development the uh, uh, EU um, moves in. The third one is the idea of vassal state. Um, and a vassal state is a state that is a rule taker, but also a state that is locked in and has no options. And I think the latter is, is interesting in a sense, also for Norway's experience, because Norway as a state has high capacity. It has a very well-functioning public administration, has very high levels of public trust in the, in the public system. So the, the role of the public in shaping society has continued and has not been that encumbered by the EU relationship. And I think this is important in that in that Norway can still stake out many areas of its own development, despite the fact that it is so heavily Europeanized. So this idea of state capacity is also something that has come up again much more prominently in relation to COVID-19, because we see the enormous differences in terms on, along these vectors in terms of how states have dealt with the pandemic. So, so, I would, so, so again, this means that there is a left-right dimension to, to the whole Brexit issue as well. So it's not only the affiliation, but it's also the left, right, the ideological dimension, what kind of society you want. And Norway's um, vision has moved towards market adaptation, but much more hesitantly than the UK, and also with a much stronger state public pres presence, with a much more prominent and, and uh, capacious welfare state, health system, and also a much more comprehensive system of gender equality much more progressive in those senses. So this is kind of the Nordic model. So, so it, it provides a different models of social and economic organizing, so to speak, um, that is also showing something about the extent to which the EU does bind. And I think it calls the bluff of some people who are saying that the UK has been run roughshod by the EU. This has not been the case. It has much more to do what domestic choices you make, what directional choices you make, and what kind of state capacity you make as well on, on this. Okay, I think I'll stop there, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. I mean, in, in, in your book, you, you make, it, make it clear that one of the kind of big differences is, of course, the size of Norway in relationship to the UK. Um, uh, how far do you think that's going to reshape the, the negotiations going forward because what's at stake is different and, and the bargaining position is different. It is but I think it depends a lot on whether um, the UK will be rule abiding or not. You saw this in the first stage of the negotiations when uh, May conceded to the EU's framework basically and therefore basically lost a lot of the bargaining levers and, and the fact that the, the financing aspect has already been dealt with also takes some of the bargaining levers away from the UK. Still of course um, arbitrariness will always be important. So, so in that sense, um, the UK might have more short-term bargaining leverage, but it will also undermine the trust 
And of course, what comes with the whole idea of, of rule-based behavior is uh, the reciprocal trust. And that is high between Norway and the EU. And that in itself also gives a lot of credit in that sense. So I don't know, a size can work. It can work in power politics, but it can also backfire in that sense. Okay, th thank you, Joe. I, I'm just going to bring in uh, Amelia now. I mean, we've got the sense of, of the, the, the political context being very confusing and very challenging, and, and this link between Nor Norway and the UK and some of the similarities and differences. But what are the policy options that are going to open up in terms of foreign affairs and security and defence in relationship to these negotiations? Thanks, Jeremy. I'm, I'm just trying to continue the, the dancing metaphors. I'm sure we all are. Um, I think there's a general uh, wish among the European unions, obviously, that the UK had been less of a, an awkward dancing partner, um, allowing the European Union to sort of continue on as the, the, the lord of the dance, if you like. Um, uh, and they've, they've, they've seen you know, the opportunity vanished now for the for the UK to be a cooperative partner, particularly in terms of internal security, which I'll talk briefly about uh, sort of quietly up uh, as a wallflower. And I think the genuine danger, particularly in security and foreign policy, is that the, and this is the last one I promise, <laughs> the UK is going to turn into the Congo <laughs> with uh, people actually <laughs> moving out of the European Union in a sort of higgledy-piggledy fashion. Um, I, I'm, I think internal security is interesting. It's got two connections with Norway, uh, which I'm sure John Eric already knows, and we'll talk about those in a second. Um, I think what's frightening at this point is the current stalemate, as we've seen, between both sides uh, on internal security. And if it's not resolved uh, soon, it's going to have profound and possibly even quite quite dangerous consequences. Um, the, the UK's most recent sketch uh, on, on internal security has simply uh, failed uh, to replicate um, the current close cooperation that it's enjoyed with the European Union on, on a variety of levels. Uh, at the same time, we've seen the EU really playing hardball. Their responses, I think, indicate a hardening of its own uh, attitude regarding internal security, looking at it in rather more absolute terms than interdependent terms even a year ago. Um, and I think li listening to some of the words used and the, and the phrases uh, regarding um, operations and relations with the UK, much more zero sum uh, and, and not as much sort of custom made. So the sort of the Norway potential, I think, is beginning to erode to some degree in terms of internal security. Um, so in terms of this, this area, we're talking uh, combating serious crime and, and terrorism. Um, we're talking about police, judicial intelligence and data gathering and also border control. Uh, so that's, it's a very wide uh, area in where they want to think of it as uh, sort of justice and home affairs, if you like, um, or, 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 or more broadly. Um, and I think what we're trying to get a sense of is the way in which the UK can withdraw from the key political structures in the European Union without necessarily promoting huge capability gaps in police and judicial cooperation and diminished internal uh, security at the same time. So the challenge at this point for UK EU policymakers is to try to identify models, existing precedents or new ways forward and uh, novel modes, if you like, by which to try to continue cooperation in security, law enforcement, criminal justice and data exchange. Um, so just to give you a couple of uh, ideas on this, and uh, Richard's given us a very nice example of when in and out harden into opt-ins and opt-outs. Um, and certainly we've had uh, a, a huge uh, series of traditions, I think, put together in terms of British opt-outs from the Treaty of Maastricht and the Treaty of Amsterdam. Uh, both treaties are very, very key in terms of internal security, justice and home affairs. Um, and in fact, using opt-outs, I think, not just as a, a way to rework the architecture of internal security, but uh, make, make a serious um, hard security indications with regards to where Britain wants to go in the future. So Europol, for example, uh, it's uh, judicial cooperation and law enforcement in terms of its, its, its main uh, objectives and very much the, the centerpiece of, of EU internal security. Um, so trying to redetermine future relations with the United Kingdom is absolutely uh, crucial at this point. The, the choice facing uh, Britain, I think, is between a sort of looser operational agreement, if they can get that done, uh, or a much uh, more emphatic, tighter strategic connection um, in which strategic agreements are, are limited to the exchange of general intelligence um, as well as strategic and technical information. Um, I think at this point, just re recalling what the House of Commons Home Affairs Committee suggested a couple of years, uh, the operational agreement um, would be preferable, but they said uh, this has to be based on existing country models. So everybody was instantly casting around for the ideal country model. Um, 
in order to prevent a sort of significant uh, diminution of the UK's security capacity. So here's the, the first reference to, to Norway, obviously, the UK's option, best option perhaps for Europol to uh, retain a decent working relationship are, are pretty iterative at best. Um, the Canadians and, and the Norwegians uh, have a, a structure uh, within the construct of Europol, if you like, allowing decisions to be made uh, on a case-by-case -case basis on information exchange. Um, but trying to deepen that, making that sort of more bespoke exchange of classified information between EU and UK entities like GCM, uh, GCHQ, MI6, MI5 um, and other broad themes, I think that's, that's tougher. That's certainly going to be on a more of a need to know basis. And, and that depends on political discretion. That, that depends on, you know, what's, what's going to be decided. In terms of Eurojust, it's sort of the neglected baby brother, if you like, of Europol. Eurojust uh, strengthens police uh, cooperation by drawing together national investigating and prosecuting authorities uh, with the purpose of combating serious and organized crime. Um, and it has a number of vital tools, some of which uh, everybody knows about, uh, mutual legal assistance, MLA, um, joint investigative teams, JITs, and the one that's most well known, European arrest warrants. Uh, which permit cross-border extradition with the European Union. Um, and many of these have been uh, very contentious. Um, ironically, it's the UK that's ten tended to do far better uh, out of many of these tools than its European partners. So the UK, for example, has extradited 7,000 individuals under this particular framework, uh, while over 1,000 individuals have been extradited uh, to, uh, to the UK. Um, Unlike Europol, this is going to be trickier. There is no provision for third countries to make use of the uh, European arrest warrant as member, as EU member states. Uh, so the UK option is therefore to negotiate, again, a similar but ultimately separate agreement with the EU, similar to those negotiated by Norway uh, and Iceland, for example. The, the, the difference, I think, is that all parties uh, to these very bespoke extradition arrangements are entitled to refuse to extradite their own nationals. So it may not be <laughs> the most robust uh, framework, at least to begin with. Um, just, just to conclude in areas that we need to bear in mind in terms of internal security, but don't always get the sort of the sexy top lines, uh, data and information sharing, um, in terms of the European Criminal Records Information System, ECRIS, and also the second generation Schengen Information uh, System, affectionately known as SIS2, these are top priorities for the UK. And again, I, you can refer to uh, Commons and Lords reports for a couple of years ago, making abundantly clear the very crucial role that EU databases play in UK internal security and urging UK EU security cooperation to be quickly restructured from either the sort of bespoke Norway perspective um, or outside in sort of opt opt back ins um, as well. So the, the, the European Parliament uh, very much supported these and they, they pointed out that continued involvement from both sides uh, needs, you know, is, is important. But what they've, they've pointed out, of course, is that UK compliance has to line up with EU data protection standards. We always love those EU data protection standards. But that throws up you know, the hornet's nest that's right at the middle of these negotiations, and that's the access uh, argument, access versus alignment, the standoff that has be bedeviled uh, many aspects of the negotiations, including free trade. And it's it's what John Eric mentioned before, it's, it's access and it's influence, and it's the conjunction between those two that I think are the most important factors in, in comparing uh, the UK um, and, and Norway at this point. Um, I'll leave it there. I've got other things to talk about in terms of enhanced cross-channel intelligence, but I know that the clock is ticking. So thank you. That's not that's re re really helpful, uh, uh, an o overview of all of those difficult and dynamic issues. And uh, clearly the question of the opt-in, opt-out element is, is going to be keep featuring and uh, particularly in relationship to, to some of those kind of nor nor Norwegian questions. I also want now just to kind of bring in uh, Albania. I mean, we're getting some of the, the detailed negotiation challenges, but underlying all of this, there is also other wider political issues at stake, which inform and, 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 and determine some of those negotiations. I wonder whether you can give us a sense of what the challenges in this UK, Norway sovereignty questions are uh, emerging and, and what the questions around immigration are in terms of mm -hmm. EU discussions. Um, yes, uh, actually it comes uh, down to the, uh, the issue that uh, John Eric described as the left-right, the ideological issue. What kind of society we want? How much a welfare state? And, and the controversy there is played out uh, on the matter of worker mobility and immigration. So the, the debate over Brexit has transmuted onto this more narrow issue of sovereignty versus immigration. It's very, a very strong issue with um, the voters. 
in back in February, the UK government unveiled a draconian uh, new law that, that, that to, to be passed, um, uh, specifically designed to deter low-skilled immigration. So it goes like that. To gain temporary work visa in the UK, European citizens will have to be English speakers with a job offer at a salary above 22,000 uh, pounds uh, a year in a high-skilled occupation. So who is that? Who is that? law targeting. Uh, this is done for the benefit of the working class voters who supported Brexit. Uh, there were about uh, 900,000 habitual Labour voters that switched to the Tories at the last elections in support of Boris Johnson. So this is being done for, for, for this kind of constituency. Um, whose vote was driven by economic and social uh, precarity, what, you know, what I describe in my, my new book as uh, economic and social precarity, uh, caused in, in kind of a feeling of, 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 of being always the underdog, uh, caused by things like job insecurity, low wages, low wages uh, bad working conditions, um, so the typical concerns of the low-skilled workers fearing uh, job loss to immigrants coming from the EU or elsewhere. But here is the paradox. Now, the UK governments, deservedly or not, but they have the reputation for blocking the development of European social policy, which is essentially employment policy. Um, so the, the European Commission found ways of promoting policies when the UK was absent from the vote, from the negotiation table, and progressively it expanded its remit of social policy. Now, the UK's withdrawal from the EU is seen as an opportunity to relaunch EU efforts at social policy. And this is already happening. We see the, the pillar of social rights was uh, launched in uh, late 2017. Currently, uh, consultations are going on for raising the statutory minimum wage uh, to the level of living wages. So while more is being done for worker protection, for social policy in the EU, and, and, and currently the push is, is, is very strong, um, the UK actually in, intends to lower labor standards after uh, it splits from uh, the, uh, the EU in order to compete with the EU in the global market. So, see, that creates a problem for the EU, of course, with this um, uh, uh, competition and, 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 and push to, to lower standards, but it creates even bigger problem for the working classes of Britain. Um, so, this is one of the reasons why, why the Norwegian model would not work uh, in, uh, in the current context, uh, because actually the EU does not have that contention with Norway, and, and John Eric would correct me, uh, about the welfare state. Uh, the, Norway has a very high level um, of social protection, so there is no um, a race to the bottom in competition with the EU as, as uh, it is happening now with the UK. Thank you, thank you, Albert. And, and, and on the, um, the, the dancing has been um, pretty unpleasant on social issues there, stepping on each other's toes, plenty. Uh, yeah. I, I, want, I want to pick up the, the, the issue of the social policy and welfare in, in a minute, but related to what uh, you're saying, we, we, we have a question that, that, that's come in from Lynn who asks, the UK seems a destination for workers around the, the EU. Isn't this different to Norway and therefore has a significant impact? Destination, immigration, um, are these the, the, the key questions that are gonna shape the outlook and the, and the foreign policy links? Richard, do you want to come in to, and respond to that question? And then I'll bring in John Eric for the Norway perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, and I enjoyed all of the uh, contributions. I think there's a, a lot to, to think about uh, there. Um, perhaps um, I, I can make a general observation, which is to, to draw out John uh, Eric a little bit more, which is that as he was speaking, um, you know, I was thinking uh, how, uh, how, how 
connected uh, Norway um, has become with the EU across time, uh, how it's carved out for itself this relationship which is walked a tightrope between uh, non-membership and, and, and being a vassal state and, and pursued that very, uh, very successfully. I think the UK is in a different place, which is I think uh, essentially the UK is, is heading out to the mid-Atlantic. And I think that comes out uh, in uh, social policy questions. Uh, and I think it comes out uh, possibly in terms of uh, foreign policy orientation. But I think it also comes out in terms of... Let, let, me, let, me, let me bring... ...for uh, a European state in a relationship with the EU. Thank you. So let, me, let me bring it in, in, in John Eric there in, in, to pick up some of those points. Yes, uh, on on immigration, well, Norway has quite a lot of uh, of um, workers from uh, the rest of, of Europe. Um, there has been instances of, of social dumping, and um, there has been criticism that the government is not monitoring this well enough. For instance, in building industries and so on. So you do see opposition to to, to this also in the unions in some places. But um, I think part the, the I think part of the dilemma here is that this is a very comprehensive welfare state and ultimately I think what some of my colleagues are saying is that this is a kind of container state, the type of welfare model we have, the Nordic model. Uh, it is based on migration among like-minded and like um, and similarly equipped and, uh, and, and uh, protected citizens. So now that you do get the solidaristic move in Europe for people to, to move uh, and higher levels and so on, you do get the pressure, a downward pressure on salaries. And, and of course, the, the question is, how do you bridge this? Uh, in Norway, they have said that we will have the same salary for everybody across the whole country who's, who's working there. But of course, posted workers and so on is much more difficult also to monitor this, you know. So that issue of social justice pops up and the volume is large enough. But Norway has, as like UK, has benefited enormously from the influx of very competent uh, people at all, in all echelons of society. So this, uh, especially EU enlargement and so on, has been a major enrichment for, for Norway, but it has, it, as, as in the UK, it, it benefits very differently. Uh, it benefits those that are employers and it benefits those that are affluent and that are not facing direct competition. And I think that's also one of the problems you have in the UK, I think one of the important differences there is that in Norway you do have a very comprehensive system of social benefits that compensates. And you also have a state that's much more active in generating activities and so on, so that people do not feel left behind in the same way as in the UK. We don't have areas that are desolate or deindustrialized or deliberately changed and so on. Rather, we have um, a, a significant uh, um, effort in, in trying to have equality across the whole uh, country in terms of economic development and so forth mm -hmm. and equal standards. I think this is an enormous difference and it works out and that has to do with the social trust. So I think you can have a generally much higher level of social trust and, and it doesn't, it's not been eaten away also by a fairly large influx of, of people from other places because you don't feel a threat in the same way. So, I, so, so this need not be only political culture, it has also very much to do with public policy in terms of, of how the, the, the public sector is working also to, to um, help people uh, who are stationed there, you know, to take away some of the alienation because most, most people in Norway are not against the immigrants. There is there is a faction, but it's also not actually Europeans so much as it's people from other parts of the world. And that then that feeds in towards racism. Uh, Amelia, the, the question of domestic policy, it seems to be kind of shaping uh, the part of the direction here. I mean, it, 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 how do you see that, that this is going to be a key factor in, in how the UK politicized Brexit? There's been, I think, a really interesting development of, of late, uh, just to touch a bit on the sovereignty immigration issue, but it, it does stick into Brexit, and that's the, that's the issue with Hong Kong, um, oddly enough. Um, a, a very interesting poll was, was done just a couple of days ago that showed that dis, despite attitudes hardening towards immigration here in Britain, 
uh, there's a very soft attitude towards the granting to British national um, overseas citizens, uh, particularly those in Hong Kong, of British citizenship, not those just who currently hold passports, but who those, it's about 300,000, the other two and a half million who are entitled to hold passports. And I, I, I found that a little bit perplexing. And all, all I can think of that explains it is either that immigration itself has ceased to be perhaps um, as spiky an issue as it was before, or there's a sense that the government just by virtue of entering into Brexit negotiations has somehow increased in the public's mind the sense that they're dealing with immigration. Um, when in fact, that as, as <laughs> Albina has pointed out, there, we've had a couple of, you know, sort of dr draconian forays, but until the uh, transition period is, is completed, nothing in terms of the European Union has shifted from, from that perspective. Um, so it, it goes, it must be a, st a step further back with regards to who are we prepared to let into the country on the basis of who we count to be like ourselves or, or more unlike ourselves. And that, that touches on national identity and, and sort of social and even philosophical areas. You'll like that, Jeremy. <laughs> so that's, that's, I think those are very key issues. Just in terms of um, sort of internal security and, and foreign policy, we, we simply haven't seen enough in terms of the negotiations yet for the public perhaps to have um, fully appreciated, first of all, how important it is to get a deal, Norway or otherwise, on, on in terms of internal security. Nor have we had any clarification as to what global Britain uh, might actually look like in terms of external security security. I, I tend to be a bit rude about this and suggest it's nothing more than a bit of a fridge magnet at this point. Um, but I, I think it would be very helpful for the British public to have an understanding of, as Richard says, how far out to the mid-Atlantic <laughs> are we actually going? And in fact, is it just that way we're going or is it other directions as well? Yeah, thank you. We, we've got another question um, come in from Jonathan here. What does Brexit mean for the EU's foreign policy and its ability to project its values and interests? In addition, does the absence of the UK mean future enlargement are now less likely? Let's try and break that question up and, and I'll bring in Richard, first of all, about uh, the, the foreign policy element. Does Brexit mean for EU's foreign policy? And, and, and I'll pick that up with Amelia and John, then come back to Albania. Richard, EU foreign policy. Well, I think there's, there's probably one great test uh, at the moment uh, where you might see uh, a, a gap opening up between the UK and the EU, which you mean yeah, we're, we're, having, we're having problems there. I'm going to move to... to, to uh, and the EU, I think, is... I'm going to move to, to Amelia. Do you, do you want to come in on, on this, this, this question here? What does the Brexit mean for the EU foreign policy? I mean, obviously, the, to some extent... Yeah, there's either, I mean, you can press the, you can fully press the reset button and say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a dramatic, exciting new opportunity to sort of break free of the European Union in geopolitical terms and to, to look for, you know, a brave new worlds of, of excitement. Um, and some have suggested a more sort of North Atlantic structure. Others have suggested, you know, looking, looking to the, the, the Commonwealth of, of Nations from that. I, I don't know if, if those allies and partners are going to be super delighted in, in terms of being named um, as, as, as prospective partners. I think more likely uh, it's the extent of recalibration of the UK interest as a whole that can be you know tolerably put into something like uh, global Britain and the way in which at, I think at this point you can measure um, the degree that Britain is prepared to to commit it's more likely I tend not to think in terms of states but themes um, so it's going to be security it could be it could be development for example areas where it's prepared uh, to get bang for its buck and on the basis of backing a particular foreign policy like development then look for the right partners to make British interests work best abroad. Okay thank you. Uh, Albina in terms of this foreign policy you're, you're, this we have a lot of discussion about moving to the mid-Atlantic uh, how, how do you see that in terms of the EU foreign policy? Um, well, the, the, there was an interesting test case now with Hong Kong that, that the EU um, basically clashed with the position of uh, the UK and, and, and the US. Uh, so um, it seems that actually China, competition with China is becoming a very strong factor. Um, more and more foreign policy is a matter of, you know, uh, negotiating access to markets. And uh, there is a very dangerous possibility there that um, the UK would put, would, uh, would actually make more acute and more uh, nasty the competition between the US and the UK uh, for China. Yeah. So uh, I fear that um, direction because that would mean um, lowering of labor and environmental standards, 
Um, so um, it's 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 a very dangerous process that we're facing. John Eric, I see you to come in on on, on this point. Yeah, on on Jonathan's question, yes, because um, I think uh, we're working on a a report on the EU's. Um, relations to non-members uh, to see if there is a kind of overarching principle and I think there is actually one unifying one that cuts across all the policy areas and that is about conditionality and that is that the EU um, it, whatever it does it the more the, the more people have access to the EU and the more uh, benefits they get, the, the, the more strict the conditions, basically. I think this is a general principle. You see this in human rights and you see this um, across with members. Of course, the whole enlargement, so-called enlargement process is really a process of incorporation. And it says that provided you want to be, if you want to be a member, you have to accept the entire key and all the provisions in the EU and so on. And the closer the affiliation, therefore, the more... Um, conditions you have to be willing to accept and also the more um, you have to be willing to submit to sanctioning devices such as the uh, European Court of Justice and so forth. So I think this has been the general principle. To me, Brexit is putting this to the test and I think this is probably the most serious test you have because if you think about the other policy areas and so on, the EU has basically been calling the shots. Of course, in relation to China and the US is different, but there this principle doesn't work anyway in this case with these states it is a question of of basically entrenching a set of rules that are guidelines in the first place um, but in relation to the neighborhood and so on this is the general principle if brexit i mean the, the whole idea of, of bespoke agreement and and getting special deals especially in the area actually on the single market in the eu you know because the eu itself is divided you know so that it has the community system which is kind of unified with the single european act and so forth uh, the four freedoms, and then it is more differentiated in the areas of foreign security policy and fiscal policy. So the EU is more flexible on, on the margins. Now, internal security has become communitarized and therefore has, has been moved into the, uh, the, 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 um, in, into the uh, community system and therefore the EU is less flexible. But, but the EU's flexibility can be read also from its own structure in relation to its, um, I mean, how it's composed. That's why it's so adamant about protecting the four freedoms. But, but my general sense is that Brexit is the one that can put this conditionality to the test. And I think that other states too that have now been subject to this will be starting to renegotiate their conditions with the EU if, if the Brits uh, get a significant headway in terms of getting special deals and so on especially in the areas on the community system with the four freedoms and so on. I would, I would suspect the setting in motion developments um, across the EIA, Switzerland, and probably even many more states. Okay, thank you. I'm going to try and bring in Richard. Uh, and Richard gave us the metaphor of the hokey cokey for in and out of the EU, but I think we need it for in and out of um, our digital connections as well. <laughs> Richard, just to bring you back in, um, it, what, what, uh, this question of enlargement, uh, when we have uh, the UK's absence. Do you want to follow up on that? Well, if I may, just to build on, on John Eric's question as well, I mean, the really fascinating uh, question about the UK is the extent to which it has impact on those who are uh, outsiders but connected to the EU in all sorts of other ways in terms of what, uh, what the leverage uh, is that any deal that the UK gets uh, transmits to others. So I think that's absolutely fascinating. On the question of enlargement, uh, I think this is an area where it's very, very difficult to predict um, because again, uh, as we've heard from other, uh, the other contributors, I mean, the EU has, has not stayed still and the EU now faces absolutely um, uh, sort of defining problems in terms of the degree to which integration is going to be deepened as a consequence of responses to, to COVID and holding together economic and monetary union. Uh, and also, of course, the, the need basically to spend huge amounts of money uh, and to incur all sorts of debt uh, um, collectively to, to keep uh, Europe's economy in shape. And I'm just not sure whether the resources are gonna be there uh, to facilitate uh, poorer countries in Europe um, becoming uh, members and, and keeping them at arm's length is gonna be much easier. So the UK being on the outside has no impact on that, but on the inside, I suspect the UK would have banged the drum that it always has done uh, for uh, enlargement uh, as being a positive uh, for, the, uh, for the EU, even if that's a sentiment that ultimately tripped up uh, the UK in terms of a gap between elite and publics, uh, where uh, you had the 
the migration from the so-called uh, so-called A10 uh, countries. So, uh, you know, but the, it won't stop the, and this gets, gets me back to Norway, uh, it won't stop the UK trying to influence the EU on the things that the EU wants to do that the UK thinks are good for the UK. Uh, and we're back to how the Norwegians have sought to have influence uh, being on the outside. Amelia, I, I, I saw you nodding there in, in relationship to um, discussion of the EU poorer countries. Is holding the EU together going to be a challenge after Brexit? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Richard um, in terms of defining problems. And I mean, one of the, it's, I think it's, it's, it's an enlargement is clearly one as, as the four freedoms and the budget. But I think, I mean, the norms themselves that the European Union itself has carved out and attempted to export and then to sort of redefine that, that has everything to do with the way in which it's going to see and negotiate its future, uh, not just in terms of uh, additional countries possibly joining the European Union, but countries leaving the European Union. Um, and in, in terms of trying to influence what it thinks is good for the United Kingdom, because like it or not, it'll continue to be a geopolitical partner. I think the EU is facing a, a really tricky choice at this point. It's seen the use of its traditional sort of shopping list of, of, of norms, you know, conspicuously fail in some major foreign policy areas like the European neighborhood policy, which just didn't stick, you know, in, in terms of uh, the, the Near East, North and, 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 and South. So in, in what it's done is sort of, sort of replace those with a rather more pragmatic uh, approach to trying to deal partner by partner, package by package, you know, really quite bespoke. Um, and what it has to now do is, is figure out whether to try to reaffirm and deepen those initial norms to get countries, current members like Poland and Hungary that seem to be defying this normative compass back online, um, or to try to have actually a softening, which I think could have very profound uh, uh, imp implications for, for its, its geopolitical uh, neighborhood, um, as the only way to possibly reach out to the United Kingdom and say it's, you know, it will, will, it'll be easier to be a partner with us because we're less demanding. Um, and we're, we're sort of scaling back in terms of our, our normative demands. I, I think it's a very, very risk. It's a very high risk strategy. Thank you, I mean, I've got another question uh, coming in. I'm going to uh, direct this one to Albania first of all, because it's picking up your question on EU workers uh, living in the UK accused of a low value and low skill um, job stealing. Um, and it, the question is how the European Union will fight against right wing populism in the UK after a no deal Brexit. Do you want to kind of come back on that one, Albania? I, I couldn't hear that and how the European Union is going to fight against right-wing popularism in the UK after a no-deal Brexit, particularly in relationship to this uh, use of low-skilled workers. Um, why would the EU be fighting uh, the populism in the UK? That would be a UK problem. But the, 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 the EU has a lot of problems with, with its own populism. Uh, and... and um, the way it is being dealt now, it's really pushing the social justice agenda higher and higher. Uh, so uh, against even my, my expectations, I've always you know, lobbied for this agenda, but uh, uh, in fact, uh, initiatives are coming both from the center left and the center right parties on, on social justice. In fact, the, um, uh, the European pillar of social right uh, was uh, originally an idea of the center right. Uh, so uh, I think that would be the way to fight populism by ensuring workers' rights. Um, currently, the EU is um, trying also to uh, provide social, to at least to, to pass some sort of um, uh, advising to the, the states uh, on social provision for self-employed workers. Because nowadays, um, plumbers are not really um, employees. You know, they're, they're self-employed and there is no proper social insurance for such people. So uh, this kind of precari precariousness is uh, very high on the EU agenda. Um, I think that's indeed the best way to fight uh, right-wing populism. R Richard, um rise of popularism in the UK after Brexit? Well, I think um, we, we, you know, Brexit itself was, was an act of uh, incredible uh, populist uh, insurgency in, in British politics. Uh, and, and the challenge now, I think, is, is how that gets accommodated within the British uh, parliamentary uh, political system. And we can see, I think, the current government uh, has wrestled with that and will continue to wrestle with that. I mean, Prime Minister Johnson, I mean, is essentially the product uh, of, um, uh, of tapping uh, that vein of, of uh, 
sentiment I think, within within the uh, the British public. So um, I, I think that, uh, that the challenge the challenge for the UK, to my mind, is essentially how we manage English nationalism uh, over over the next few years, which may or may not be be populist, because you know the UK faces this union of the United Kingdom management problem uh, as much as it does its relationship with the other union, the European Union. Uh, and to me, those are going to be the kind of let me just bring in um, British politics uh, over you, the next while. Thank you, Richard. I'm, I'm going to bring in, in, in John, uh, John and Eric. I mean, one of the things that you uh, raise in the, at the end of your book on squaring uh, the circle on Brexit is, is the impact on Norway of Brexit. Um, can you give us a sense of uh, what the post-Brexit world will be like for Norway? What are the implications? They, they can be quite profound too, of course, because the UK is Norway's largest single trading partner. Uh, so economically speaking, the, um, the, the, this can be significant. Now, of course, m much of that trade is happening um, in the oil and gas in, uh, sector, and very much of that will be uh, subject to long-term contracts, so, so probably not in that sense. But the fisheries issue is very, very um, tense issue of of quotas, uh, access to to uh, waters, and and it's a very complicated issue um, with multi levels. So it has it has several um, levels also, and and actually, uh, I mean you you have. Um, EU UK negotiating some aspects in terms of trade and setting the terms of this. You have uh, EU um, UK Norway Iceland on on this. So I mean, <laughs> the very negotiating situation itself is very complicated, um, and um, the, the the uncertainty you get. I mean, what they have done is they've dug up the foreign ministry has dug up agreements from before to try to set set up um, and and read resuscitate many of these but of course there is this uncertainty of what happens at the end of the year also with citizens you know and their rights um, even if they have said that they have uh, probably that one has been sorted in the first phase of negotiation but the economic fallout can be quite significant in this and I suspect the hard Brexit could set in motion um, a further debate on um, on the uh, um, in in Norway on on its uh, relationship to to the EU as well, um, it could actually also then um, the uncertainty could also actually get a debate on membership again, which has been completely uh, away uh, on this. But of course, uh, if the UK really moves in the neoliberal direction, I, I suspect that the uh, current um, uproar, uh, especially in the trade union about the EA agreement might debate a bit, but it's uncertain. So, I mean, Brexit is setting these things in motion. And of course, if you do get the uncertainty of, of a hard Brexit, I think it's set, it'll set in motion all kinds of things that we have no real sense of, of, of where it will be. And also um, the animosities, you know, you get as, and there will be a fallout from this. And for Norway, then um, some people at least will be running for shelter and the EU is a shelter in that sense. It has shown to be the shelter in, in, in many ways. So, yeah, it's... Thank you, thank you, John. Um, I think we're realizing that the complexity of this dance is ongoing and unfortunately we've run out of time. I see lots of questions have come in, but we'll try to answer those afterwards. Can I say thank you to Richard, to John Eric, to Amelia and to Albena. Uh, there's many things to discuss, discuss. We'll have to come back to this issue as I'm sure we will but everybody can follow this on our YouTube channel where you can pick up this uh, webinar and all of the other webinars. Thank you again to all our panelists and I look forward to seeing you all either in Brussels or on our webinar series come September after the summer recess. Thank you again to uh, Richard, John Eric, Amelia and Albania and thank you everybody for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>